our, our Meet and Maze webinar this morning. Uh, there's something new, very new, that I suppose we'll spend a good bit of time on today, and that's the Canviso Beat, which is new technology for Beat. Uh, and I'll bring you through, I suppose, the main points involved in, in, in using it and the advantages that it offers. Uh, look, these are two very important crops, I suppose, for, for Irish farmers. Um, they're important for arable farmers uh, in many cases as a, as a crop that they can sell. And for, for livestock farmers, look, they're, they're key forage crops on, on many farms for, for winter feeding. Uh, so look, it, it's an opportune, I suppose, time of the year to talk about them in that will be so, these crops will be, decisions will be made and, and sowing will be done over the next four or five or six weeks. So uh, I suppose the agenda, first of all, I, I'll take you through the Canviso beet. Well, a couple of bits in, in general in terms of beet first, and then we'll go through the Canviso beet. Uh, and again, look, that, like I say, that's technology we've been waiting for for, for quite a few years. And then uh, uh, Joe Millerick will join me then for part of that, uh, as Joe would have, they would have brought a crop at home this past year, and Joe saw a lot of crops around the countryside. And then after that, we, we, we'll have a discussion on, on the changes with beet herbicides. There's some changes to the conventional chemistry. And Scott Lovell will join me to, to discuss that and he'll share some of the, the, the information on that. And then finally, we'll have a look at the, the maize varieties. And Ken, Ken Daniels, who has vast experience in that whole area, will just give us an, an update on the, the, the position with varieties for the year ahead. So just in terms of, of the, the, the webinar, again, look, it, it's, it, it's a great way to share information with a lot of people with, without um, inconveniencing them, them in having to drive to see us or whatever. Uh, in terms of, of the webinar today, look, if you have any questions, we'll take them as we go. Or maybe, look, I'll go through the, the Canviso slides first and any questions that pop up after that, we'll, we'll try and deal with them as they come. And the way to give us questions is the question and answer, and answer icon, the Q&A icon on your screen. If you type the questions into that and we'll deal with them then. And just as suppose another piece of information, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available to everybody, everybody then after about four or five days once we, once we have it ready and we'll, we'll send the link to people. So uh, to start off, I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to take you through some, some slides on, on the beat side of things. Okay, so I hope everybody can see that. And so uh, some of what I'll do is, is just uh, just a couple of slides at the first that are general in terms of the beet crop, um, uh, but we'll move on to the Canviso as quickly as possible. So starting off, look, it, 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 as a crop, and, and look, this is, I suppose, a, 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 it's an interesting thing for everyone that's dealing with the crop each year to see where it goes in terms of area. So the, the area for 2020 was 9,000 hectares, and these figures are coming from the Department of Agriculture in the, the single farm payment areas that they collect. So it was down a little from 2019, uh, which was 9,500, and 2018 then was a much bigger area because uh, the, the spring was very tough and lots of people saw it as a, as a, a kind of an emergency fodder crop. But the expectation for 2021 is that, look, I expect it to be similar to last year. In some areas of the country, there's probably, you know, there might be slight reductions and in other areas, it'd be, there's probably going to be little increases. In terms of crop usage last year or crop yields, the drought certainly through Leinster and up into the northeast had a significant effect and beet was scarce in those areas and the trade was very good. Probably in Munster, there, was, there were better crops and, and, and I suppose the trade was more normal. So then I'll just give you a, 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 an idea of all the varieties we have to offer. And this is kind of the information that we share every year at this time of the year. But I have one very interesting and uh, a welcome addition to this list for, the, for, for this particular year, and that's the Canviso varieties. So in terms of how they stack up in terms of yield with, with the other varieties that are in the market, this is the best information that we can offer. Um, and it's based on... Like we've been trialing Canviso beet varieties for five, six, five or six years at our trial site in Cove. And uh, obviously, look, we've been trialing the other varieties for much, much longer. Uh, and so, look, this table, from our point of view, gives the best information we can give as to how the yields of all the different varieties will compare with one another. Um, our kind of biggest variety in the market is Enermax. So it's a white beet. Uh, it, it's super high yielding variety, very good leaves, um, and look, lots of satisfaction out there among farmers with that variety. It's 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 a sister variety or it's a similar variety to Magnum, just that it's a newer one. It's a twenty 
it, it's 20 years after Magnum, if you like, in, in terms of breeding, and it has that eight, seven or eight percent extra yield then that you'd expect from that from that that interval. So, uh, in terms of comparing everything, that's a hundred in terms of relative yield in in dry matter and in fresh yield, and so then. Uh, the highest dry matter yielding variety we have is, is the sugar beet Alicia. So that's at 12% more than, than Enermax in terms of dry matter yield, but 3% under on fresh yield. And then the, the, the two Canviso varieties that we have to offer, we have Smart Sanya and Smart Brianna. And we had, we had 20 crops or maybe 21 or two crops of these all around the countryside last year. So we got a good look at them there. And we also had both of them on our trial site. So the Smart Sanya is the one that, 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 that definitely is, is the one that looks better. It's that bit higher in yield. So it's, it's 9% more than, than Endermax on dry matter yield and just 5% less on fresh yield. And the Smart Brianna then comes in 3% less than that. But the other kind of standout point, I suppose, about Sanya is that it, by November, it had much better leaves. So in terms of harvesting efficiency, is Smart Sanya is the one that I'd be recommending to people. We have both varieties in stock, but most of what we have is Sanya because, of, again, of the experience that we have and what we saw in the fields last year. So, that, look, that's the varieties. Um, look, the, the other ones that are there, and again, look, the, the, this sheet is available to anybody who wants it, and look, we've sent it out to a good number of people already. Uh, Cagnote is a high dry matter variety, but it's yellow. Uh, um, so maybe, look, if someone's looking for a white one, it's the Enermax really is the one to go for. Uh, Cagnote stacks up very well in yield and in fresh yield. The advantage with it is that because it's, it sits higher in the ground, uh, it comes out of the ground cleaner. So it, it fits in a, you know, on farms, particularly that mightn't be washing. And then in the medium dry matter segment, uh, Geronimo is our standout variety. It's a new one that we've had for the last two years. So it's 95% of, of, in terms of dry matter yield and it's 111%. So it's 11% more than Enermax in fresh yield. Again, it's a yellow variety, very similar to Bolero and Rabas, if, if you like, which are the ones that it would, that, that it would replace in the market. So all these varieties are available. Uh, Jamon at the bottom, I suppose, essentially is a grazing variety. But in that segment as well, Geronimo and Bolero and Rabas are all very suitable for grazing as well. So again, look, I suppose the key thing there is uh, where the, 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 those can be so beet varieties fit. Uh, so they're, they're almost yielding at the level of Alicia. Uh, and um, we'll, we'll go through the other advantages that you have from those type varieties um, right away. So in terms of, look, this is a slide that I often show in terms of where varieties fit. So if someone is, is using the beets themselves and they're washing it, well, then I'd be certainly going for the highest yielding variety. And if they're a little bit dirtier, it doesn't make any difference. So it's Alicia or it's Canviso or it's Enermax. If they're using it at home but not washing, pick it a clean harvesting variety. So it's Geronimo, Cagnote, or Bolero. Where someone is selling roots in it, they've got to be white. Well, Intermex is going to give you the highest fresh yield. Alicia and Cambisa are just a small little bit behind that. But if you can get a premium for sugar beet, which is which is is, is worth it is worth the premium, it's worth five or six euros more per ton, no problem. Then Alicia and Cambisa are the best ones then. And then if you're selling beet and there's no worries about the, the color of it, um, then Geronimo, the highest fresh yielding variety, is the one to go for. And as I say, for grazing, it's Jamon, uh, Geronimo, or Bolero. So look, that's, that's most of what I have to say about varieties. The one other bit in terms of, of, of seed dressings, all the varieties are dressed with forced insecticide, and they all have the same rate of forced insecticide. So that's a very good... So it's a very good insecticide for the, the majority of, of pests that, that crops will encounter, particularly all the soil pests. It's very good on all the does. It gives a little bit of protection on mangle fly, which essentially is not a soil pest. It's a crop pest. Uh, I've seen it before in, in fields where one half had force and one half hadn't. And definitely there was a significant help from, from the force, but it doesn't solve the problem. And look, we've had more mangle fly problems or issues in crops in the last year. So that's something that people need to keep an eye on and put out a fungus or an insecticide if necessary. And again, look, it, it doesn't give any control for leather jackets. And the other, I suppose, important pest that cropped up in the past year was we had issues with virus yellows, uh, which is spread by aphids. And the force insecticide doesn't give any protection against the, the, those aphids. Um, we had applied for, along with uh, some of the other uh, distributors in the market, we'd applied for a derogation to see if we could have some gaucho or cruiser on beet seed again. But the Department of Agriculture, after 
it's been quite a while, I suppose, determining what to do, they decided to not to give us the derogation. So all the seed will have forced insecticide. And they look, everything has a good fungicide. And they all have tachygarden and some of the varieties have vibrance as well. So then look, just, a, I suppose, a, a nice picture of beet on a sunny day. And that's what we're all trying to get to. That's our variety, Geronimo, which, as I say, was new in the last couple of years. And with that then, look, I suppose we get into the main thing, I suppose, or the most interesting thing we want to talk about today is, is the Canviso beet system or the Canviso beet package. Um, and I'll just lead you through a number of slides that explain the important points. Uh, we have... We have lots of, I suppose, knowledge or, or material uh, uh, available to people. There's a very good growers handbook available from KWS, which will deadly di digitally forward to anybody. Or we will have paper copies in a couple of days, and we can we can send them out to everyone. And ideally, look, every farmer who's growing the crop needs to have this book on hand so that they have a quick reference for all the information that they might need. We also have an agronomist handbook, which gives a little bit more information on some of the on some areas of of, of the the technology so that's available as well and we'll be getting that out to everyone who's everyone who's a customer of Conviso Seed will be get will be sent those things and then we have we have a I have a quick two pager that kind of covers as I see it all the important points and look that's probably the quick reference that everyone should definitely read before before they trade the the, the, the seed or before they trade the the concept or before they grow the crop so with that then just to lead into the, look the important bits of information I suppose beet is, is it's an it's an important crop worldwide from a sugar point of view. It's an important crop in some areas from a fodder point of view. Uh, it's not a big crop, I suppose, in terms of arable area worldwide. It's not a big crop, uh, but it's very important in some areas. In Ireland, we had a sugar industry up until two thousand and six, and since then, look, we've got about sort of somewhere between nine and twelve or thirteen thousand hectares of, of fodder beet being grown each year, and that's a very important crop. We, you know, in the areas that it's been grown. There hasn't been a lot of new technology in the last 20 years um, or in the last 30 years, really, from the point of view of herbicides to, to, to deal with the weed challenge with beet. And with, with that, I, I, I suppose KWS uh, are, are the biggest seed company in the world from the point of view of, of beet seed. And they looked at it and they, they, they started need to, saw that they needed to make a contribution in this area as well. And they had come across... Um, some some bee plants that showed resistance to sulfonylurea herbicides. So, and, and it's, at, it's at this point in 2001 that they sort of said, look, they need to do something and they need to try and develop another concept or another way of controlling weeds in bee crops because it was such an important crop from, from their point of view. So what they did was uh, it, it, they've come up with a package where you've got specific varieties of beet that have the genetics in them and it was all got there through conventional breeding because they'd identified some beet plants that were resistant to SUs. So they developed those varieties up into high yielding varieties that have all the traits that good commercial varieties should have, but they also have resistance to sulfonylurea or the ALS inhibitor uh, group of, of herbicides. So that's the KWS contribution to the package is it, it's the seed and it's producing the, getting these varieties up to yields that can compete with all the other varieties in the market. And the second bit then is a herbicide that you can use on those crops, and that comes from Bayer. Uh, and so it's a mixture, and we'll have a look at it in a little bit more detail, it's a mixture of two, of two active ingredients. So I'm just going to take you through, I suppose, the key points in using Canviso and in getting the best out of it. There's so very important things that I suppose need to be considered. But I suppose a quick summary really is that uh, what you get is you get excellent control of broadleaf weeds and particularly the very difficult weeds that that are there for the conventional weed control system. Things like fool's parsley, wild carrot, fat hen, runch is a particular problem um, at the moment, cleavers and knotgrass. So all those, what we consider the normal difficult weeds, they're all really, really well controlled with this. Also, there's excellent control of grass weeds with this, with the Canviso 1 herbicide. So there's no additional graminicide needed. The only uh, grass weed that might need a bit of extra attention is black grass. And that's not a big issue uh, that I've seen anyway in, in the beet grown areas that we have. Uh, uh, the, the real extra, I suppose, or one of the big extra bonuses you get is this fantastic control of any weed beet or wild beet that's in people's fields. Uh, so it, it will give 100% control right up to a very big plant. So that's, that's going to give a one-time 
I suppose, solution to any weed beat issues that people have in fields. Uh, and, and that will have an important, I suppose, contribution on some farms. Uh, there's really good crop safety, so the herbicide doesn't have any effect on the Condiso varieties. Generally, you will have you will have fewer applications. It can be done as a one spray or a two spray program, so that's going to save time. There's a bit more flexibility in the application window, so that that will help, I suppose, managing difficult workloads on farms this time of the year. And because it's one herbicide, with maybe you know there might be some little bit of mixing done of, of, of conventional chemistry, but for the most part, it'll be one herbicide. So, so there's no mixing, so there's less less chance of things going wrong. So then just, I suppose, the basics about the Calviso 1 herbicide. And, and I should say, the varieties are all, look, they're all called, the, the SMART is at, is at the start of the name of all the varieties that are, that, that are part of the Calviso package. And the herbicide then is called Calviso 1. So it's a post-emergence herbicide. Uh, it's sulfonylureas, as I say, which is what we normally call them, but they're ALS inhibitors. Uh, there's two active ingredients in it. So there's, there's pharmasulfurin, and uh, my pronunciation might be perfect, and these tie in carbendazone methyl, and it's an oil dispersal, dispersal formulation. So what's very important is, is that it has soil activity, and it also has, it also has uh, foliar activity. So it's given you the same sort of package as we get with the conventional chemistry. It has a, a residual effect at least as long as what you'll get from the normal programs that are people that people are using and then it can be used in the crop from a crop point of view once the true leaves arise up until eight true leaves that's the window for use and that's the window that you need to use in any way in order to get control of the weeds and it can be done as a one spray application of one liter per hectare or two by a half liter per hectare and uh, it, you can use uh, conventional chemistry in sequence with it or in tank mixture and that's where there's a couple of weeds weeds that I suppose can be so one isn't great on, and that's to try and tackle those. And we'll talk about those a little bit more in a while. So then, uh, I suppose, I have a number of points that I just want to make that are, are very important for, for farmers when they're, when they're using can be so one. And one, I suppose, the first one is really that sprayer cleaning or sprayer hygiene is very important. And what makes it most important is that Look, first of all, the Calviso 1 herbicide, I mentioned it's brilliant at killing wild beet and weed beet. It's also brilliant at killing conventional, any conventional variety. Uh, a slight drift of them, it'll kill them, or a tiny bit of contamination in the sprayer. And if you fill the sprayer afterwards, then to go spraying conventional beet, you're likely to kill the whole crop. So the key recommendations here would be uh, when you're going to spray your Calviso 1 crop, uh, if you've previously been spraying uh, a conventional beet crop with a herbicide, that's okay because you can use conventional herbicides on Conviso beet. So it just needs a rinse out or, and, and that's fine. That's no problem. Any other operation beforehand, you need to give it a proper clean out with, uh, with, with, with you know, the, full, the full works in terms of cleaning out and using the Altier Extra. Uh, so that's that that that's before spraying, and then after spraying with can be so one. It's definitely recommended to give the sprayer a full clean out with all clear extra. And the reason is, okay, it, the 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 can be so one is absolutely lethal on conventional beet, um, but it's also a very good killer of volunteer cereals and anything to do with cereals. So it, it, you need to clean out for for if you're going spraying cereal crops afterwards as well. So uh, and and then the other precautions that would be needed. Uh, because it's so good at killing conventional beet, when the drill is being, it, it comes into the field to sow conviso beet, empty it. There's no point in sowing 100 meters up the, the headland with conventional beet that's left in the drill because it'll just kill it. Um, and then things like, I wouldn't split fields uh, if you're growing conviso one grown in a whole field situation. And if there's conventional beet over the ditch, be careful of spray drift. So then in terms of the timings and the sprays that, that are put out, uh, with the, the two spray program, the first spray and, and, and really the target is to time it based on the most advanced weed. And in, in a lot of the literature from KWS, they use fat in as their target weed. So once there's two true leaves on your most advanced weed, go with the first application. And then the second application comes usually 10 to 14 days later. Now, if there's really dry weather or if there's no development in further weeds, it can be delayed a little further. But normally it's 10 to 14 days later. And then look for the vast majority of situations, everything's done. 
Um, and like I say, there's a couple of weeds that you might need a little bit of extra attention. And this then is is the, the diagram to, to where there's one spray application. And in the crops that were grown last year, I'd say about half of, of the farmers used one spray application with the one litre per hectare. And the other half did the two spray application. Uh, both worked very well, particularly if they were timed right, they worked excellent. I, I would probably say that with the two spray application, you have a bit more flexibility. And where that would arise would be if you're targeting, and like you see on screen, the one spray application should be applied when there's four true leaves on the most advanced weeds, we'll say fat in. Now, if when that date arrives, suddenly you get 10 days of very poor weather where you can't spray, when you go back in, the, the, the chemical is going to be challenged to control some of the weeds. So if a half rate had gone in a week earlier, there's less of a, there's less of a risk of, of weed issues afterwards. So like I say, the one spray application works fine if the timing's right at the four true leaf stage of the most advanced weed. So then just looking at the, the different weeds that in terms of control that, that you're getting, and this is based on a very large, I suppose, a, a number of trials that have been conducted by Bayer and KWS. And you can see, look, there's very, very high levels of control for the vast majority of weeds. And I suppose to point out the ones where there isn't very good control, Speedwell is kind of the standout weed that, uh, you know, you're not, you're only getting 40, 50% control here. And that's a weed that if it's in the field or if a farmer knows it's there or sees it's there, it's necessary to add in some conventional chemistry to, to take care of it. The other ones to watch out for are chickweed that's resistant to SUs, um, carmarigold that's resistant to SUs and thistles. They're really the ones. And look, RH as well, if you don't get the timings right, it might need something like a bit of Galtix in order to knock it down completely. But other than that, there's a very complete package. And again, in terms of grass weed control, look, that's kind of all the things that you're going to normally deal with in a crop, including including couch grass, scotch grass, basically. So you're getting very, very effective control across the, the range of, of grass weeds. So then just a few of the other points. Um, if you like, it's a unique chance to kind to 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 to, 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 to sort out weed beet and wild beet situations in fields. So it'll allow you to go back into those fields that might have a big seed reserve or wild beet in them, and it will control weed beet up to very strong, very strong levels. Now, when you're using it at the normal uh, application timings, that's not going to be an issue. You'll be hitting the weed beet when it's very small anyway, but it's highly effective on weed beet. I suppose the, the really important thing, and we'll cover it again in a minute, is we don't want to establish uh, weed beet that's come from these canviso varieties. So that's very important in terms of avoiding any bolters in the canviso crops or where there's roots that are left unharvested uh, and they grow, you know, they go into their, through their normal life cycle of producing um, leaves again and, and stem growth and they flower in the following year in a cereal crop or whatever. Uh, and they would then produce seed. It's really important to make sure they don't survive in the following year. So in the following cereal crop, it's important that um, you use a herbicide that will control them. So it, it, just in terms of crop safety, and we've seen this as well over the last number of years in the trials that we've carried out, when you spray Canviso 1 on, on a Canviso uh, seed or a Canviso plant, there's no effect. It, it's as if it wasn't sprayed. Um, and we've had that, we've seen that in the field ourselves. On the other hand, and we're all used to this when you're using conventional chemistry, you almost, in order to control the weeds, you very often have to essentially hurt the beet plant. And so that's what you see with, you know, I suppose on a doubling of, of, of herbicide with, with, with the conventional herbicides on, on the right-hand side of the page there. So that's one, I suppose, significant advantage. Uh, again, because of, of, of the, the, the risk of, of killing any conventional beets, uh, it's really important to know and that everyone on the farm that might be doing any of the operations, particularly the spring, knows where the Canviso beet is sown. So we have gate markers um, and those will be available from, from Gold Crop to, to, to make it easy, I suppose, for farmers to, to stick it up in, the, up in the gate of the field so that everyone knows what's inside in that field. Uh, so again, it's about knowing where, where, where the Canviso crop is planted and making sure that um, there's no contamination or there's no possibility of Canviso spray going on the classic varieties. Uh, it just, you know, if it does happen that there's crop failure and for whatever reason it could be, you know, a flooding issue or it could be a pest problem that suddenly means that the crop isn't viable anymore, the options are relatively limited if the Canviso herbicide has been applied. 
So you can resow with Candiso beet again, or the only other alternative uh, is maize. And wait one month after the Candiso one herbicide has been applied, and then plow the field, and then you can sow a maize crop. Uh, in terms of the following autumn, if a crop was taken out really early and you want to sow a cereal, well, winter wheat is the only option. Um, so look, generally, to be fair, there won't be autumn sowing usually in, in, in beet fields because the crop is usually still in the ground. And then there are also, there's one or two restrictions for following year crops. And look, this is a list of the crops that are allowed. So it, 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 to be fair, it, it has most of what anyone will want to sow. Usually it's going to be a wheat or a barley that will be sown um, and possibly a maize crop. But uh, the crop that isn't there is oats. So oats is not, al is not allowed as, as a following crop to can be so beet. Uh, if spring oilseed rape has been sown, it, it can't be sown until one year has passed from the date of the can be so one application. Uh, so again, we mentioned a while ago about bolters and you know having wild beet descended from can be so beet, if you like. So there's two important steps to avoid that. Number one, have zero bolters in your Canviso beet field. So, you know, once the summer comes and, you know, it's not unusual that you will have some bolters coming from the sown seed, but they need to be pulled the same as you would do in any other field. But I suppose it's more important here if you're trying to avoid a, a, a Canviso resistant bolter in future or weed beet in future. So any bolters that are in the crop need to be pulled. And the second very important bit is any root that's left on harvested in a beet field, look, generally their normal life cycle is to regrow the following year and produce a flowering stem and, 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 and produce seed. So normally in conventional bees, th those roots as they regrow in a following cereal crop, they're very prone to being killed by any sulfonyl urea herbicide. Uh, and usually people don't even have to think about them. But in this case, it's different because SUs will not kill them. The, chemi the chemical that needs to be added to control them is uh, 24D. So 24D is, is very effective on them and you can use it as your partner with the SUs in the following spring barley or spring wheat crop. Um, it, MCPA also works but I, I, I don't think there's any MCPA product at the moment with a cereal with cereals on the label. There may be some with off-label cereals so that can be used as well but they are the two best herbicides for controlling the ground keepers that would grow on a following crop. I suppose one last bit is that because this is new technology and the, because there's something that, that, that that's worth protecting, can be or KWS require anyone who grows the crop to essentially sign an end user declaration and get it back to them. And the purpose of it is to try and highlight the, the, the important points listed here in terms of managing the whole system, making sure bolters don't arise and looking after the herbicide so that you know we don't allow weeds to become resistant to it so preventing seed return preventing the, protecting the mode of action and using the system accurately now look it's not a normal thing i suppose for for crops where the 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 owner of the seed or the supplier of the seed will require uh, an end user declaration but it is required for anyone growing can be so beat and kws may well, look, might, may want to just phone up people and just check to how things are going just to follow up and make sure the technology is working for people that will also happen and so when anyone is buying seed from us uh, we'll be sending out the relevant documentation and expecting a copy back of the injured user declaration signed by the farmer so the conclusion really of what the whole package offers it's a uh, very broad spectrum weed control less applications and a bit more flexibility in terms of the window of application and uh, look, I suppose very efficient weed control and that's what we saw last year. Uh, the crop uh, the crop isn't affected by the herbicide so it's very safe from that point of view so there's no there's no there's no negative on the crop and look it, it's a good way like again with very effective weed control there's going to be no seed weed return into that field for, for that year. And so look that that's kind of covering I suppose the, the all the key points and I'm sorry for for having so many slides to, to, to go through and, and I suppose this kind of a format, but uh, with Calviso it's very important to get all the important points across. So so with that, and, and just for maybe you know seven or eight minutes, I, I, I'll bring Joe Millerick into the discussion and Joe is, is, is one of our, our sales reps with Goldcrop and Joe also, um, there, he's farming at home with his dad and Look, they would have grown can be so last year and also Joe would have visited a good few of the crops in, in, in the area that were out on people's farms. So I suppose just to get 
uh, a kind of a, a broader picture of the whole thing. Um, Joe, what, Mike, what are your thoughts on the Canviso beat and how did you find it at home yourselves this past year? Hey Dave, um, no, look, we we couldn't recommend it highly enough. Um, we were delighted to get the opportunity to grow it. Um, we grew it in a field. We would have grown beet or the sugar um, industry back along and this field would have been taken out of beet production due to issues with wild beet. Um, but look, when this, when this uh, opportunity came, there was a five acre field we put in, um, the smart beet and look, we, did, we went with the one liter option. Um, we sprayed after three weeks, the beet got a great start. It was sown on the 7th of April. It got six mil rain the following day and it just took off. And we were amazed. The germination was excellent. Um, we used uh, two liters um, of spray and uh, three weeks later at a liter a hectare rate. And um, look, we were, the weed control was excellent. Um, there'd be a problem with scotch in this field. We didn't have to use a griminicide. There'd be a problem with charlock. It was taken care of and canary grass would also be an issue. We, these these weeds were, um, they, they didn't become an issue. Like So we were, we were delighted with it. Um, that, that was our that was our um, scenario with the, with the weed control. Yeah. And I suppose in terms of, um, like I said, all the weeds were controlled in your field and in, we'd say in other farmers' fields that you looked at any weeds that presented any kind of issues in those? Um, like uh, you touched on um, SU chickweed. Um, there was a small few issues around by ditches with chickweed, but in general, fields were spotless um, in one, one, with the one run and the two runs, uh, excellent control. And the wild beet is just a huge plus. Um, it's, it's, it's bringing fields back into production that, that haven't been in beet for years. It's opening up rotational options for farmers as well. And um, it, was, it was an excellent product. And we will, we will grow it again in fields with wild beet issues. And just in terms of the the appearance of the crop, we'd say like the root color, and we'd say how how the level of, of, of establishment. Like did what what I've seen in fields is that nearly every seed grows, and yes. you get a very consistent run of beet. Was that your experience as well? Yes, like we would we would sow you know forty thousand seeds per per acre, and look, the in virtually all grew like so. What the big advantage with that for us was when our contractor came in pulling with an armor salmon harvester, it was the beat was even. There was no bump. There was no bumps. It was lovely and even. He could take out a. He, you know, there was very few groundkeepers left behind, and it was very easy for him to pull it. And there were all, all the beat was going up into the harvester. Um, so look, that was a big advantage. Um, the, the germination was excellent. Like we, we, um, I've seen other fields. We've grown beet before, and you know, you, you just they're excellent and very even, so consistent. So look, that that was a big advantage we found growing the beet. And our contractor was was happy as well that that it wasn't that it wasn't bumpy and uneven, which makes life difficult for him. And we want to say, what date did she harvest it, Joe? So we harvested. We we have a dairy farm at home, so we we'd harvest. It was a five acre field. We harvested um, two and a half acres at the start of January and we harvested the rest uh, about three weeks ago. So we're feeding that, feeding that beet now at the moment and look, it's holding excellently. Um, it's, it's in a clamp. Um, we're chopping it and washing it for the cows and look, they're milking mighty and we're, we're very happy. The sugar beet is giving an extra kick as well. We're, we're finding that in this year with the milk. Like, so. I look, yeah. uh, look, it's fantastic feed for, for any any livestock, you know, dairy cows or beef cattle particularly. Uh, and just again, look, a comment from my point of view on, on the establishment, like we definitely find that like the KWS varieties that we sell tend to have extremely high germination and, step, and crop establishment. So again, most seeders are set to sow the 40,000 seeds. Your target yes. plant population for a crop is 30. But we tend to see 36, 37,000 plants establishing with Alicia or with now with these can be so keep can be so varieties. And okay, while you won't have these great big roots that you might see in other fields where there's, yes. there's gaps at either side, you have a very consistent size of root all through the fields. Um, any any other, I suppose, comments or, or tips on a job that, that you think might be interesting for people? 
Yeah, like just the sprayer is is really something that to, to watch. Like, um, and we it's it's a mighty job. One run we did all year. We only went into the field once to spray herbicide. Um, once it's done well, done at the right time. We done it three weeks after sowing. It was an excellent spring last year, so the weeds were germinating away. Uh, there was no dry spell down south with us. Um, so, yeah, just excellent as regards work, um, work and labour. One run into the field, as long as it's done right, couldn't recommend it more. Um, and the full field, as you mentioned, worked worked for us like we we would. Um, the full field was was the only way to go, and the field was kept away from other beef fields as well. So it looked worked well for us. And it, like and yeah, you mentioned like managing the sprayer and all that, and, and the sprayer washing, and, and like, did you find that the other farmers who grew it had they any any issues with washing the sprayer? Were they happy enough to, to that you know, would say what was required was was easy enough to manage? Oh yeah, like like farmers were as 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 long as farmers were explained to and and told in advance, they were they were very happy to do it, and you know, um, you know, a, a, another good tip was telling farmers to spray. Their, their conventional beef first, which took risk out of the system. Um, that was very important. And uh, look, it worked well. It just, just communication was vital and just keep reminding farmers of the importance. Of the uh, I think, look, in general, uh, farmers are very conscious of, of the, the risk with sulfonyl ureas in, in, in beef crops. And yes. uh, I suppose for that reason, there's quite a few farmers who have two sprayers, have one dedicated to beet and one dedicated to cereal crops. Um, the, the, the complication here is that now that that dedicated that sprayer that's dedicated to beet it can't be used. You know, it has to be washed out between conventional beet and or between the conviso and the conventional crops that they might harvest. Yes. Right. Look, I think that that's probably a good summary of, of the whole concept, Joe. I suppose the couple of points I would like to just finish up with on conviso beet is that. It's it, it's a crop that uh, well, beets a very important crop to gold crop in that we would distribute something around two thirds of the seed that that, that that the industry and that farmers use nationally. We've been working on or and, and trialing the Canviso varieties for about six years, and essentially, you know, waiting patiently for for it to become available as a commercial offering to farmers. Uh, I, it, in terms of cost, it, it, it stacks up a, a similar to buying seed and uh, and a tree spray program. That's where it fits in. But it, it absolutely definitely gives you the weed control that you'll get from a tree spray program. So, you know, in terms of value for money, it, 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 it works very, very well. So... Um, the, 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 yeah, the, the, and, and look, as a, as a package, uh, you know, we, 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 it's available, the seed's available right now, it's available to the industry, and we do expect it to be, you know, to be good take up there, and certainly people to try it out maybe in year one. So I suppose, look, that's, that's the Conviso side of things, um, uh, and we can move on. And look, certainly, if there's, a, a, or sorry, I just see, yeah, there's a couple of questions there. Um, I nearly forgot to deal with the questions. Uh, so I have a question from Shea Phelan. Uh, 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 a lot of reports of virus yellows in crops last year. Any solution? And, and look, that's one that look we 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 will we'll comment on just in the next segment. Uh, the Canvisa one label says no tank mixing. Is this the case? So again, uh, 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 on the label they're talking about using conventional products in sequence. Uh, look, the, the information I have from Bayer and from KWS is that the they. they they don't have any issues with, with with the conventional products being tank mixed with beet, just to take the normal precautions of making sure that the crop is capable of coping with whatever sprays might be used, or, or you know, that the, if you have a crop that's suffering from from pest damage or that's sensitive due to weather issues, that just be careful of the loading that goes into the tank. Uh, and then I see another question, like Northeast suffered a severe drought last season and germination was all over the place. Is it advisable to delay weed spraying in these conditions? So look, a very good question. And I'd nearly say, look, the country was split in two last year in terms of the, the, the you know, the impact of, of the drought in that 
in Munster, uh, we'll say the first four weeks of relatively dry weather, there was almost a day of rain each week that kept everything in, from an arable point of view and from a beet point of view moving along just really well. And, and those four weeks in Leinster right up in the northeast, there was no rain. And then th there was another four weeks after that of no rain. Um, and so crops in, in Leinster and the northeast really did suffer from an established point of view, an establishment point of view. And the advice there from a weed control perspective is, uh, okay, because Canviso 1 is so crop safe, even, you know, if, if, if you've got a variation in the plants that are there, so maybe one's just coming over ground and maybe one's up as far as two true leaves, there isn't going to be a crop safety issue like there might be, like you'd be worried about with a conventional herbicide. The target here is that you want to get the herbicide on at a time when it will effectively control the weeds. So definitely in that situation, I would say it's a two-spray program and when the most advanced weeds from that, that grow from, you know, when the crop is sown, when they hit the two true leaf stage, I'd be going in and spraying them. And with that, then you're putting residual chemistry on the ground, which probably isn't going to work very well. But with the Canviso herbicide and the way it's formulated, when the rain comes, it activates the residual part of the, the herbicide. So it will kick in when the rain eventually comes. And when that rain comes, you're likely to get a big, a big germination of new weeds that come. And so I would be delaying the second spray until there's a suitable flush of weeds to be dealt with. And so more than likely, and in some cases last year, it would have meant, you know, the first spray going on and maybe a month to the second spray. So that's one thing that's going to require a little bit of, I suppose, advice maybe or um, using experience or using, using the local agronomist maybe to, to come up with a solution. Right, so look, the next area we want to cover, and I want to bring Scott Lavelle in, into the conversation with me. And Scott is, is uh, I suppose, from a whole crop perspective, he's the man that looks after everything to do with the, 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 crop, chemical, the crop chemicals and right through all the different uh, crops and all the different uh, um, uses that might be required. He also is, is, is the head of CropLink, which, which is, uh, I suppose, an important supplier of, of chemistry to the market. So, Scott, uh, I suppose, look, th th there's been some changes in the conventional herbicides that are available in the market. Do you want to just take us through those? Sure, uh, Dave, yeah, and you're, you're right. Obviously, the, the Conviso Beat, I think, is the, the major attraction of, of this webinar, and it's the most new uh, piece of the jigsaw in terms of beat, and I, I think it, it certainly has a big future. Um, as regards conventional chemistry, I suppose the point is for the last number of years, um, three-way mixtures uh, of, of three different active ingredients, the likes of your Bethnal Max Pro and your Sniper and Trilogy and so forth, have formed the backbone of, of the conventional um, wheat control and beet. And with the demise of one of those active ingredients called desmetaphan, it is means that we're almost going back to basics a, a little bit. What I might do is I might just share a screen because sometimes when you're talking about these um, uh, these chemicals and active ingredients, it can be difficult to picture. So I, I think that was a nice picture you supplied me with with, with Dave of a very very clean beat. And sure, that's the target whether it's whether it's conviso or whether it's conventional. That's what you want to end up with, and that's what's going to make um, the farmers happy. I suppose. Look, what we were talking about here. If you look at the Bethel and Max Pro, which would have been particularly at T1s, I would say the standard bearer over the last number of years. Three active ingredients there you can see across the top there, uh, desmetaphan, fedmetaphan, and ethofumazate. Lenison was only a small addition. That's that's actually Venzer. Uh, but there would have been other versions of that, the likes of Sniper, which would have been a, a very popular product as well, um, had different concentrations of those three different active ingredients. So this one, this metaphan, is now gone off the market. And therefore, as I was saying earlier, the likes of your Bethel Max Pro and your Sniper are gone. So um, what we have up in this slide here, and I know when we were chatting about this over the last month or two, Dave, you were making the point of what's there now is much more similar to the likes of the Wizard and the Goalpost. So we need to get back into that frame of mind. But to be clear, what is actually going to be there in the uh, in 2021 is straights. So our offering is beat up flow, which is straight fed metaphan, and oblix 500, which is straight etofumazate. There will be other versions of those about, but to my understanding, that it is only 
uh, straight products that are going to be available. Now, this doesn't affect the likes of your um, your your Galtics and your Venzart. Those are still there. We're just talking about these three-way mixtures and the replacements for them. So I suppose the simplest way of putting it is if at a T1, for example, you were using half a litre uh, per hectare of Bethel Max Pro, you're going to be replacing that with approximately half a litre of beat up flow and 0.2 of a litre of Optix 500. And if you look at this, you can see that that exactly replicates a litre of Wizard or Gold Post, which would have been common enough products used in, in the past. You can see that these uh, ratios of active ingredients that you are left with are quite different to the Bethnal Max Pro and the Sniper. And probably because, particularly with the the Oblix, the Ethofumazate, because of the, the straight nature of them and you're actually using higher levels of individual active ingredients, you probably just need to be a little bit more careful in terms of um, your timings. Uh, we were just saying, or you were just making the point, Dave, that how um, how well Conviso Smart Beat tolerates uh, that herbicide. And I suppose, look, some strong levels of these could be challenging for a beet crop that was under pressure and i suppose that's where uh, the agronomists will, will have to make the individual um decisions about what, what goes in, in the tank and just you know sort of summarizing that point there if you were looking at which would be very common in the past for t1s 0.5 of bethel max pro or 0.4 of sniper you're now looking at a half a liter of, of beat up flow and a 0.2 of a liter of Optics 500, or let's say moving to your, your typical T2 rates, it might be a, a liter and a half of Max Pro or 1.2 liters of Sniper would have been used in, in, the, in the year just past. It's going to be a liter and a half of beat up flow and 0.6 of Optics approximately, but that will be decided in terms of um, uh, the, the agronomist making the decision in, in the field and so forth. And the last slide I'll just throw up, and I'm not going to, these are only examples, they're not by any way prescriptive. Um, all the agronomists, and I suspect the farmers that are listening, know that you know you have to make a decision based on the beet that's in the field. But certainly, I would suggest the vast majority of beet now tends to get a debut program at, at T1, which is much safer. So as I say, typically that would have been included maybe half a litre of, of beet up flow, now it's going to be half a litre, sorry, it would have included half a litre of, of Bethnal um, Max Pro. It's now going to be half a litre of beta flow plus 0.2 of Oblix approximately and in your standards of your, your Venzer and your oil. But that is dependent on um, what, uh, what weeds and what stage they're at in the, in the field and indeed what, where, where the crop is at. And for your two, T2, um, you'll be replacing your typical litre and a half of, of, of Bethnal Max Pro or 1.2 of Sniper with your one and a half of beta flow and 0.6 of Oblix and your typical other other rates that are in there. So a bit like yourself, Dave, I'll make the apology for throwing it up on the screen, but when you're talking about different active ingredients and different products, it can get a little bit confusing. But we have a, a, a very nice handout that you you did out yourself there, just, just showing that simply that is that is available to to uh, everybody that's watching this morning, if they haven't already got it, just let us know and we can we can get you a copy. Right, that, that's great, Scott. So look, essentially, the the, the 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 tools are there to continue with very similar programs to what people were using so far, just to replace the the, the mixture products with with straights. Yeah, I mean, you would look. There, there are pluses and minuses of that. It does give individual ag agronomists because they're they're straights. It gives them a little bit more flexibility to put the rates up and up and down depending on what's in the field the downside is that particularly for uh, farmers who have smaller areas it's a little bit more difficult to fit the can size into, into the areas but uh, you, you're correct the, the chemistry is effectively the same it's just the loss of one active ingredient the, the desmet okay so, so look, just the other area while, while you're with me I, I just want to talk about uh, a problem i suppose that that cropped up widely last year um uh, was virus yellows so uh, virus yellows, i just give, it, I suppose, a few points first as I see things, but virus yellows ha has, been a, has been a big, big problem on continental Europe and in the UK uh, over many, many years uh, as a beet pest. Uh, we haven't seen too much of it in Ireland. Uh, look, 
often you might see a little circle in a field or a couple of circles in a field where there's a little focus of infection. But look, there weren't really any any full field issues noticed to any great extent up until last year. And I suppose there's reasons for that, and, and or we can think of reasons why, why that might be the case. But one particularly important reason is that there are two aphids which spread virus yellows. They, they, they essentially work in a similar way to barley do a yellow dwarf virus being spread by, by virus. But So the peach potato aphid is, is the biggest culprit and the peach potato aphid just doesn't like rain. So if you have showery and wet weather, it tends to, it tends to limit the scope of them or limit their development, probably washing them off the plants and they don't get to infect plants then or, or cause problems in crops. So that's one issue. And okay, last year we had a huge amount of dry weather at the period when the crop would be at risk, so they didn't have the rain to contend with. Um, and look, the other big risk factor would be um, the, fall, the infection has to come from somewhere, and usually it comes from a few roots growing in, 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 in you know, maybe the waste heap that's left by the yard that might have had a little bit of virus the previous year. Those roots with leaves um, are, are a source of infection and if the aphids feed on them and then move to your new beet crop that, that's how infection will take place so minimizing those sources of infection and minimizing something we were talking about while well, grow where ground keepers are growing in cereal fields and not being controlled um, uh, they, they can also be a source of infection if they had virus in the past year so the risk probably from a, a source of infection point of view in the year ahead is higher than normal um, and so what we have to look at then is, you know, maybe controlling aphids and um, reducing the spread from that point of view. Well, in terms of hygiene, I'd say, look, any bits of waste beet that might have been beside the cleaner in the yard or any, anything like that, get rid of them. Get them in a situation where they can't grow um, uh, uh, and become a source of infection. And in, in, you know, the unharvested roots that might have been in cereal crops, once you put in a proper herbicide into them, it'll take them out of the equation as well. And, and I suppose I would have looked around at a lot of crops during the year last year. In Munster, I saw very little virus. I only saw a few circles in fields here and there. And up, right up, I suppose, up the East Coast and up to the Northeast in particular, there were a lot of very yellow fields. But I'd have to say that most of the yellowing I saw and most of the full field scale yellow situations I saw was uh, boron deficiency was part of the problem. Uh, and if you like, Boron deficiency is something, again, that uh, has been more of an issue in recent years, partly because we're trying to produce over, you know, you're producing higher yields of beet now than ever before. So there's a higher boron requirement in the field because you're taking out 30 tonne of something instead of maybe 20 tonne that was being taken out 20 years ago. Um, so, so look, that, that, that's one issue. But secondly, the real high risk scenario for boron deficiency is a long extended dry spell where... Okay, boron is water soluble, so it's not it's not available to, to to the crop in any great extent during that period. But then, when the rain comes, and usually this is happening in in July or June or July or August, because the the soil is warm, beet has a huge capacity to grow and requires an enormous quantity of boron in a short space of time, and it often can't get that. And so, foliar boron applications would be the answer. And um, so, I would say, look after an extended dry spell watch your crops and put in boron uh, foliar application you know if there's any if there's any risk in a field uh, so look that, that that was one situation look certainly a good there was a good bit of boron deficiency and maybe in some cases look it might have been tied up with virus but there was more virus last year and um, I, I suppose in terms of, of, of knowledge and what to do the, the the recommendations from the UK are from the BBRO which is the the, the, the research organization on, on beet crops in the UK. Uh, the advice from them is that you spray, you put on a suitable insecticide if you see one wingless aphid per four plants, per four beet plants, and that's up to the 12 leaf stage. And after the 12 leaf stage, if you see one wingless aphid per plant, you go in and spray. And so until you hit those thresholds, there's no, there's not enough benefit from the actual, from going in spraying. If you hit those thresholds, yeah, you need to spray. And the challenge here then is, and you might cover it for me, Scott, is that uh, the, the aphids in question are resistant to a lot of the insecticide products that we have available. Um, I should also say that, look, we had applied for a derogation to use Cruiser or Gaucho, but as I said earlier, look, that, that wasn't forthcoming. So, Scott, you might just mention what products we, we can use maybe to control aphids. 
Yeah, I mean, look, the debut we were very well covered there in terms of you know cultural um, action and maybe looking beyond, as you say, because uh, I would be very similar to you, although I would have been very much monster based last year. I didn't come across too many fields that were very badly affected, but nearly every field that you went in had some level of yellowing in circles, which was in 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 some cases was undoubtedly virus, but maybe other other things as as well. Um, but look, the reality is we're losing actives. We mentioned the Desmond fan in the in the in the, in the herbicide case, um, and you know um, you, you know things like dimethoate, which was a systemic um, um, insecticide, albeit used in in, in in cereals, that is now gone as well. So the, the options are limited. Um, for, look, I suppose first of all, in terms of what's what's cleared, you have the likes of Karate, Karas. Lambistar, Desis are all cleared, but they are exactly in the group that you're referring to there, Dave. Like that, they are um, potentially uh, there is resistance there in in the aphids. The reality is there is good data in the UK to show that there's a, a a large level of resistance there. We're not very far away from the UK, despite Brexit and all that, that doesn't affect where the aphids come from. So the likelihood is that we will face challenges here. We don't know how big those challenges are. Uh, and, you know, there were lots of things you mentioned earlier about mangle fly, etc. So there would be reasons why you might be using the likes of those, those, those products, and they may still work. The only other option, really, but it has a different mode of action that's, that's cleared, is uh, Tepeki. Uh, now, Tepeki is also only contact. How long you get, best estimates would be 14 days, but that would be very much depending on your the weather, etc. And I suppose if you look back to, and you mentioned the BBRO recommendations, they talk about um, finding a, we- a wingless aphid on every four plants is kind of the threshold. If you're above that, that you need to, you need to spray. So... I'm going around in circles there a little bit because the options are are limited. Um, I suppose to, to be clear about what the options are, you have your 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 Krati, your Karis, your Lambistar, your Desis, and there, there are others, but they're they're examples as your con, uh, conventional um, aphicides. Um, but they are all what's known as pyrethroids, and there's suspicion, but not confirmation in this country, that there is a level of resistance to, to those. In which case, to Pecky, which would be significantly more expensive. Uh, would be the the only other option that's there. Okay, look, I I I I, I think that's a very good, I suppose, summary of, of, of what people can do. Um, I'm just checking the questions there. Um, okay, yeah, uh, I just see there's one there. Does canvasia beet last as long after washing compared to conventional beet? Yeah, look, it, it, I suppose I think that's just in relation to to when it's when it's stored in the clamp afterwards, and that and and look, our experience is that it does. It, it is a typical sugar beet. Uh, so in terms of uh, look, the only thing that's been done different in the whole Canvisa program is the weed control, and the 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 breeding of the varieties and everything else about the varieties is is similar to what you'll find with something like Alicia or any of the other sugar beets. Uh, I did come across one situation last year where one of the crops of Canviso beet also had some boron deficiency and there were certainly was issues then with like with boron deficiency. You can get essentially a rotting of the root of the of the root at the at the shoulders of the root and that did cause problems in that situation. But other than that, look, everything else in terms of managing the crop and feeding the crop is the same as you'd you'd find with conventional beet. Yeah, just to touch on the yield there, we just didn't mention it. Like, um, was yield yield parameters I would have come across during the season would have been anywhere from around twenty five to thirty ton an acre. Um, and look, as regards stacking up against other varieties, growers were extremely happy with that yield. Like, and the year that was in it wasn't the highest yielding, wasn't the highest yielding each year of all compared to twenty nineteen. So look, that'd be. That'd be around the goal of the yield. Um, and I suppose one other thing just we're, we're spraying that we nearly got caught up with at home is just fellas going spraying grain after beet. Just be fierce, careful, like, because, you know, you mentioned the graminicide activity that Conviso has. So just be so careful when you're going spraying grain after, after spraying Conviso. Um, Thanks, Joe. So look, I, I, I think... 
Sorry, Dave. There's just one other. There's just one other question in there. I think I think we've dealt with it already, but just just in case, asking about uh, mangle fly uh, damage um, and what you know, what are your options there? So you know, you are you are okay there with your with your karate caris um, thesis. Those those type of products will will do a good job of controlling controlling those, and they can be mixed with the herbicides once there isn't too much of a challenge on on on, on the crop. Okay, thank you, Scott. And look. Uh, to be fair, uh, the, the 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 level of, of issues with mangle fly seems to have increased significantly in the last eight or ten years. Um, it's much more common now and much more prominent in, in crops around the countryside. Uh, and definitely up until sort of the eight true leaf stage of a crop, it, you know, mangle fly can do a lot of damage because they're getting rid of leaf that should be contributing to produce the next leaves and the next part of the crop. Um, I've also seen a good bit of damage in crops kind of mid-season, like in July and August. And look, realistically, the, the, the impact of that on yield isn't as significant, though I have seen huge amounts of damage in fields at that stage. So again, it might be worth treating. So look, thanks, Scott. Thanks for, for that. And, and thanks, Joe. And look, that's that's covered, I suppose, all the, the, the issues in relation to beet that we wanted to cover this morning. And uh, look, Myself and the lads within Goldcrop are all available to, to, to deal with any any questions directly that might come in afterwards. So now I want to, and, and we have a good bit of literature available then, I suppose, to, to, to give direction or to that, that contains all the points that we've discussed this morning. And that's available. You just give us a ring or, or, or an email or whatever, and we can send it on to you. Next, I want to move in I just, I, I, maybe seven or eight minutes just talking about maize. And look, there isn't anything anything significantly new this year except... We want to just give it a run through, I suppose, where the crop was this past year and uh, what's expected this year and the varieties that we have available for the year ahead. So I'm just welcoming Ken Daniels. And uh, Ken has has looked vast experience of the maize crop. He's very involved with our crop development within Gold Crop and the varieties that we bring to market. And so I'll just ask him to kind of give us a run through things. But first of all, Ken, um, just in terms of crop performance last year and, and you know how the year fared and maybe... Um, you know what, 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 what outcomes were there? What, 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 what can you say on that? Thanks, Dave. Yeah, well, uh, the crop performed quite well last year. Um, you know, there was there was good tonnages came in at the harvest time in springtime. There, as you mentioned earlier, the weather was very dry, and we were work, uh, concerned about establishment, but it didn't seem to affect the maize. Uh, plastic. Uh, Kept the moisture in the soil, and so we got good establishment of crops. And uh, you know, they developed well during the season and didn't get any early frost or anything, so they came to maturity. And uh, there was good images of, of silage came into the pits. I think, in general, farmers were fairly well happy with it. I suppose the best measure, uh, you know, indication we have of yields around the country might come from the areas where. The departments do their trials in the maize grown areas, and uh, their kind of average uh, dry matter tons worked out about sub over 17 tons per hectare uh, from average around the country last year, which would be good. And that, and that was at a dry matter level over 30% dry matter, so you know, they were good mature crops. And uh, I think farmers' experiences they got a reasonable tonnage off their fields as well coming into the pits. All in all, it was a satisfactory year. We settled for the same again, I think. In the last four or five years, or even six years, maize has been quite good. Yep, very good. And like, is there much maize left in yards, do you think, at the moment? Well, th th there is a bit of, uh, you know, you had good yields in general uh, last year. And, you know, there was a great back end there to the uh, growth of, of grass as well. So there was big pits of grass silage there as well. Um, so I suppose, look, it's not a bad situation to have a bit of silage left over, uh, particularly maize, because uh, you never know what the growth is like go going to be like for um, for grass in uh, in April, particularly the second round now. Uh, you know, with a cold weather predicted there, we could be short of grass in the second round. And maize in that situation would be an ideal complement to maize grass, and thus uh, grass grasses is... is can be low in, in dry matter and high in protein. Maize is very high in energy and high in dry matter, so they complement each other very well. And uh, most people, I think, would be quite happy to have a bit of maize left over. You can always seal down the pit again. 
And if you get a bit of dry weather or drought in the summertime, look, it's, it's, it's great to have it there and it's easy to feed out, again, to supplement if there's a shortage of grass. And then just what are your thoughts on, on the crop area for the year ahead, Ken? What, what, what will people do, do you think? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think they've been satisfied with the crop there for the last five or six years. Um, the numbers of dairy cows, I suppose, has been steadily increasing. There was a big increase after when courses went, and uh, I suppose there was there was a, an increase. There was also, a, I think, you have a slide there on the on the area of maize through the various years. Uh, there was a, an increase there in uh, 2018, in the very dry year, and certainly maize proved very valuable that year. But it's hovered around plus or minus 15,000 hectares uh, for the last number of years there. And, uh, you know, with, with uh, increased numbers of cows, I suppose, on the gra grazing platform, it's an opportunity for farmers maybe to grow a crop of forage maize off the grazing platform and have one harvest of high quality material coming back in there in October. And, uh, you know, you're... you're, you're uh, it's not affecting your grazing platform and uh, it's an ideal way of getting extra forage into the system. Okay. So I suppose look, the, the important area from gold crops point of view, Ken, is, is the, the varieties and what we have available and what we have to offer to the market. So will you just, I suppose, give describe what we have and, 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 sit, and maybe where they fit into people's, people's crop management? Yeah, well, I suppose the, the, the best... Uh, Promise of those is the measurements there, which we have from the recommended list, which is from the, come from the trials, which the department will carry out over a number of years. And uh, if a variety performs well, then after three years, it's added to the recommended list. Now, in, in maize, uh, there's, a, there's a range of maturities there. And in this instance here, we've divided them up into early maturing types medium maturing types and late maturing types and they all have a place dependent on the individual farmer situation and his site and what he requires. So the first variety there is ambition and the first column there gives the yield of dry matter at 87 and you might say that's disappointing you know why is that variety there on the recommended list but when you look to the next column there it's got a start rate of 121% of the controls, so it's very high for starch, and it's high dry matter is indicating there at 118, that is a very early maturing variety. So what it might lack in, in overall green tons, it makes up for it in terms of the starch content. And for somebody maybe who's, who's uh, buying maize or asking somebody, a tillage farmer, maybe to grow maize for them, uh, that's the type of variety I'd like to get back because it has very high feeding value with the very high starch content that's in it. Um, so, you know, ambition definitely has a place there in that situation. And we'll look at it later on again. It can be grown with or without plastic. Most of the crop is grown with plastic now, but ambition is one variety. That, you know, if you have a favourable site, you can grow it without plastic as well. So then as we move to the later um, more medium maturing varieties, which would be a bit, a bit uh, later than ambition in, in, in harvesting. Uh, you know, if you sowed ambition in a normal type of growing season, you might expect it to be harvested before the end of September. Whereas with the next two, they're spicy and feedy top, we'd be expecting in a normal year, they'd be, uh, you know, in the, in the first half of October, you'd be harvesting those. Uh, so their yield is up. Uh, from ambition, the, the, the yield of dry matter that you get per hectare at 95, 96 there. And uh, the starch content is quite good also uh, at 107, 108. I should say, I suppose, that the, 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 the control varieties here are generally taken from the later category. So uh, they would have a uh, higher yield of, of dry matter. So the, the earlier types, the earlier medium types, then would fall below the 100 uh, in terms of, of dry matter. Yep. So the, in, the, in the later category then, uh, we have gold crop as one variety there, LG 1235, which is out of the recommended list a couple of years ago. It's a uh, respectable yield there at 106, uh, good starch content, and uh, you know, it is that little bit later in maturity. But there is a place for uh, for people who have, uh, 
you know, good sites and that, uh, it can you can uh, avail of the extra yield of dry matter that's coming from those uh, later types of varieties. So when you're choosing your variety, then as where you're going to sow it and what your size is like, uh, we've just done a little chart here that gives you an indication on that. So the first variety there, Ambition, if you have a marginal size uh, or moderate size, or also if you want a very early harvest, uh, Ambition would be a variety to choose. Similarly, if you have reasonably good sites or very good sites, you have the option of uh, growing spicy or feedy top. And uh, then if you have very good sites, uh, which you might have in, in, in uh, maybe parts of the south of the country and coastal areas, uh, you know, south facing and warm sites, early, early gro uh, growing fields, uh, then you have the option of sowing these later types of varieties. And, uh, you know, you, you'd be aiming then uh, to get a long growing season with those. So you'd be, ha you'd be harvesting, say, after 20th of October, or you'd be leaving them as, as long as possible uh, when the weather would be suitable uh, to fill the cobs for as long as possible. You'd be talking about the, the, towards the end of October harvest there with those ones. Okay. So that's, that's, yeah, that's all the plastic, the variety suitable for sown under plastic. And then I suppose we saw maybe a slight increase on the area sown without plastic last year. So just, I suppose, mention what we have from, from that point of view. Yes, yeah, yeah. So the Department of Agriculture used to do extensive trials of maize under plastic, but uh, for the last few years they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, do some measurements because the vast majority, I suppose, had been grown under plastic. But uh, just to say there, as I mentioned earlier, that there is a few varieties that you know, perform very satisfactorily in the open if you have a good site without uh, plastic cover. So ambition there is one variety that has uh, shown to have very good yield. Uh, it's early maturity, which is essential with if you haven't got plastic, uh, because in the open maze it's going to take two to three weeks uh, longer to mature without the plastic than as if, if it had plastic cover. And the starch content, as we mentioned in uh, previously, with ambition is very good, and this is what you need really uh, from coming from maize. That's what you're growing it for, to produce a tonnage of starch. And the second variety the gold crop have there is a variety called Glory. It's even earlier, slightly earlier maturing than, uh, than Ambition and uh, very good starch as well. So, you know, if you found yourself in a situation for one reason or another that it was getting on into, well into May and you hadn't sown your maize, uh, glory and you want to sow on the open glory would be a, a good opportunity a good option in that situation I suppose it, it, it's fair to say Ken that look, we, 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 we've we continued to trial the uncovered varieties every year and ambition is still the best variety that we've seen from any of the breeders who give us material so yes. look, it, it stacks up very well on the, on the uncovered situation yeah so look, I suppose look, that's I suppose a lot of the, the important information we've covered um, just in terms of, of sowing dates what would you recommend with, 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 with sowing dates for people for the year ahead or for you know for the for, for the, the uncovered and also for the, the covered maize yeah i suppose it's hard to be precise uh, you know too prescriptive about a particular date because uh, you know and the, and the law of averages um we would need um a temperature a soil temperature to you know to be right for sowing maize either on the plastic or in the open you can tolerate slightly lower temperature when you're sown under plastic because the plastic heats up the uh, heats up the ground, and so you can sow that bit earlier, maybe a fortnight earlier, under plastic than you can in the open. But uh, you know, in general, we would be expecting those kind of temperatures, say in the second week of April, anyway. You know, the soil temperatures would be would be around that, and of course, it's important to have good conditions as well. You know, the, the dry soil and uh, when you're sown uh, maize well. and uh, then with the uncovered uh, you know you'd be probably going a fortnight later than that you'd say around the 20th of April or either side of it there if, if, if the temp ground temperature is, is reasonable about 10 degrees for uncovered maize Very good and then I suppose the last point we just wanted to cover um, measure all was a, a, a fantastic bird repellent product on maize for, for many many years and disappeared out of the market last year and so we had chorus. How did you find 
that worked and, and, and tell us about what's available for the year ahead? Yeah, well, I suppose we were all very concerned there a couple of years ago when we heard measure was going to go off the market and that we wouldn't be allowed to use it because we have a lot of crows in Ireland and uh, if you get dry weather uh, during the Afrin maze is emerging, uh, you know, it's, it's easy pickings for them and they like it. Uh, measure all was a great treatment in that the crows didn't like it and uh, it was one of the effects of it. It, it, it protected the crop from crows. But... Uh, we had a, a product called Corret last year, and uh, we had uh, some experience of it from before, and it seemed to do a good job. And certainly last year, I didn't uh, come across uh, many complaints from, from people uh, complaining about board damage. I think it did a very good job. And for the coming year, we'll be going with the same seed treatment again. Uh, seems to have done the job anyway, and uh, I don't hear people crying out for measure on, uh, you know, to be brought back or anything. So, obviously, Cart has, has done the business there. Okay. Um, so, I just see, look, that, that's an excellent rundown and all that. I just see a couple of questions there. So, there's one question there. Do you need to add a wetter or can you can you mix Galtix with Canviso? So, uh, the, the, the use of, of the vegetable oils with, with Canviso, is actually recommended if, if if weeds are getting a little bit strong or if you have very dry conditions at spraying. Because in very dry conditions, sometimes the, 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 the wax layers and leaves get a little, and the weeds get a little bit more, more, more difficult to penetrate. And so there's no problem whatsoever adding in the, the vegetable, the normal sort of like product like fortune, the, the vegetable oil waste can be so. And certainly, if you're adding in something like Galtics, which can be so, yeah, the vegetable oil would be a help in improving the, the foliar activity of the Galtics as well. So, yeah, so maybe like in a normal situation, um, if, if, if you think you've got a bigger challenge in terms of weed control, absolutely no problem putting in the vegetable oil with can be so. And it will also help then any, any other products in the mix, particularly like the Galtics, it would help. Uh, Another question just in relation to plastic and the future of plastic um, and then any and, and, and any research looking at open maze again um, and just in terms of new varieties coming along. So yeah, look, in terms of plastic and it, we have mentioned a few times that, that, you know, there are doubts up ahead as to what type of plastic might be available to us in the market and uh, the EU have taken steps to try and and, and I suppose ban some of the the products that we that had been used in the past, and look, I, I would essentially take my direction on, on this whole area from the plastic manufacturers, and I got an update during the week. And look, the current situation is that uh, the EU certainly had taken steps, um, and it was, I, 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 but it hasn't progressed, and there was a risk that we would all be forced to use 100% uh, biodegradable plastic and. Look, that product is certainly significantly more expensive per kilo of plastic. Uh, at the moment, the, the, the products that are in the market, there, isn't, there doesn't appear to be an immediate risk to their use. And particularly, like we'll say, the, the Samco Clear product that, that we would sell in Gold Crop, that would appear to be okay for the next few years. Um, Europe, I suppose, maybe due to lots of other things that they have concerning themselves in the last year, haven't moved the, the, the discussion forward to any extent. Um, in the future, if uh, we do end up with only being able to use the more expensive type of plastic, the biodegradable plastic, uh, uh, what I hear is that uh, look, it's likely that the, 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 the machinery and the equipment and the way the plastic is being applied will be adjusted to try and reduce the impact of the increased cost of the plastic. So maybe uh, look, one one option is to just put a single row of plastic uh, on each row of, of maize, and then there's less plastic being used overall in the crop. So that's so at the moment, look, it's 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 no change for the next couple of years. It it, it was planned by the EU to, to outlaw some of the products by by this year, but that hasn't actually happened. So the, so look, we we we've sort of a status quo there for the moment. In terms of the open maize varieties, the department have again started looking at open maize varieties. Now, I suppose the, the challenge here is that because the climate of Ireland is not similar or is a little bit 
less suitable for maize than a lot of the, the countries where, where the, the, the maize breeders are located. The selection of varieties or the choice of varieties that's available it tends to be a little bit limited, but it is likely that, look, we will identify good new varieties that will have been tested across the different sites the Department of Agriculture have, and we can hopefully you know, offer higher yields and better quality with uncovered crops also in the future. So I suppose look, that's, that's the comment on that. So look, that, that's, I suppose, our agenda for, for, for this morning covered. We've had good interaction with uh, quite a few questions. Um, look, I hope everybody found the information useful and topical. And again, we really appreciate being able to get people's time at such a busy time of the year. And OK, this type of webinar format, I suppose, is very suitable from that point of view in that it doesn't interfere with the rest of your day. So I, look, I'd like to thank my my uh, my co-speakers with Joe Mellory, Ken Daniels, and Scott for the information they give us. And look, as I said, we're available to anyone that wants to get in touch directly with us to, to get more information or to get uh, to dig into things a little deeper about the issues we discussed or about any other issues, really. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.